Well, good morning, Village. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Kind of, all right, we got some waves over here. Let's try that again. Good morning, Village. So good to see each and every one of you there this morning. My name is James. Welcome to Village Baptist Church. I want to say Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing this morning. We're going to start with Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and we're going to go through some Christmas carols. Y'all sing with us, all right?
stood by his mother's side. He lay the Savior in a manger. Oh, what a glorious night. Oh, what a glorious night. I hear the angels sing. together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come into this room today to bring worship and honor and glory unto your majestic name. And fathers, we've studied this morning, we're to come before you with triumphant joy, to be excited, to be exuberant, that we get to come into the throne room of the God of all creation. We give you worship, we give you praise. And Father, we pray that you speak into our hearts and into our lives this day. In, uh, in might and in conviction and in, in your strength. And Father, we pray today for your church all over the world that you will keep it not only provided for and protected, but that you'll keep it focused on Christ Jesus, your Son. May your Spirit move freely among us, and may we, as your people on the earth, bear witness to his name. We give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. It's so good to see you as we come together on this uh, Christmas morning here in Destin, Florida. And uh, we want to welcome all of you who are not only in the room, but also those of you who are joining us by live stream. You have joined in with the Village Church of Destin, Florida, and we're glad that you're part. I've got good news, y'all. We have a 40% chance of snow right here on Christmas Eve. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, you know, it's not going to be much, but hey, I'll take it. You know, kind of make it, you know, like a Christmas card, Christmas card effect. 
But anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, you know, since we met last Sunday morning, uh, we did angel tree distribution last Sunday afternoon. Went the smoothest that it's ever ever gone. And uh, I imagine Deb Hobley's watching us by live stream right now. And Deb, thank you for uh, putting all that together. She's now moved south, uh, trying to get to where it's no chance of snow and uh, and such. But uh, we we uh, were able to minister to 350 children uh, last Sunday afternoon. And so uh, God, God is doing great, great things. On Tuesday, we had our uh, widow's brunch, our annual Christmas widow's brunch over at the Henderson Beach Inn. Had a great time with all of our widows, a great time coming together. Thanks to John and Terry Kazak for uh, putting that together and making that work and all the effort they put into that. So there's, it's been, you know, it's been a busy, busy week. But God's doing things, and we're excited about what God's doing. We've been focused on Behold this year for our Christmas theme. And um, who remembers what it means to behold? To observe. To observe and to see and to fill the eye with. And that's what we want Christmas to be about, filling our eyes with Christ Jesus. Uh, let me share with you, um, is there any other announcements? Am I missing anything? You want to remind them, uh, Christmas Eve, we have two options for Christmas Eve this year. That's right. At we have 4 o'clock service, and then we have a 6 o'clock service. We're doing that, obviously, so folks can be socially distant, so right. we don't have to fill the room annually. We have a great participation in that. So 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock this Christmas Eve. You had stuff on your sweater, Eve, man. I had stuff. I'm surprised Grace didn't get it. She's my, I uh, know. my ballet. I understand. <laughs> you can relate, right? I can relate. Beverly's got you covered most of the time. Right. Yeah. Hey, these guys also, what Steve didn't tell you, they also opened their home to all of our staff, and we had a great time at their house fellowshipping together and celebrating the Christ of the season, and we're so grateful for Pastor Steve and his leadership. Would you join me in expressing our appreciation to him for the way that he's led for 28, 29 years now? Amen. Thank you, brother. I'm not even that old. But, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a great, great week and uh, school class earlier. That's one of my most favorite services. It's so simple and it's so gathered and uh, so focused. And this year, uh, we're going to be baptizing in at least one of the services. Hopefully after today, we'll be baptizing in both of the services. But, uh, you know, we're excited about that. That's what Christmas is about. It's about receiving the gift of God. Mail your check by snail mail by going to 101 Matthew Boulevard. Destin, Florida, 32541. You can also text to give by texting Village Destin to 73256, or you can go to our website, uh, villagebaptist.org forward slash give, and we so appreciate that. And if you're in the room and, and uh, prepared, uh, we have uh, offering plates set up at the doors. Uh, you can drop off there as well. Uh, we're, uh, we're in the middle of our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and um, and, you know, that's a, a part of supporting the, the international missionary uh, forces all over the world scattered. And uh, a couple of our uh, international missionaries were supposed to be here in December, but they've been held up and unable to get here. But we're glad you're here. And my prayer for you today is that you will experience the mighty blessing of God in your heart and in your life as we worship him today. Let's continue in our worship as we continue in song. I did think of one other reminder, and that is our Sunday morning small groups will not be meeting next Sunday, uh, December 27th. So all those who are used to bringing their children, uh, and also those Sunday morning small groups will be off on January 3rd as well. But we will have our morning worship next Sunday, 10 a.m., and on January 3 at 10 a.m., just the, the early groups that meet at 9 o'clock will not meet for the next couple of weeks. You know, as we continue in our worship of the Lord, I, I think it sometimes gets lost in the season because we hear it so often. The name Emmanuel means what? God God with us. Exactly right. And we just kind of, we hear that so often. It's become a part of our story every year. But pause with me for a moment this morning and think about what does that mean? God with us, the one who created it all, the one who set the stars in the heaven, the one who 
tilt the, the earth on its axis so it would be just the right temperature for life to exist. The one who understood all the intricacies from the atomic and subatomic and quantum level all the way to the great macro beautiful majestic pictures of the Grand Canyon. The one beyond that which sees the, the order and the beauty as the stars rotate in their galaxies. The one who has a great big picture of all that but also he has chosen to become Emmanuel, God with us. The King of Kings laid down his throne. He set aside his Godhood to come and be found in form as a man. Being found in form as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Why did he do that? He did that because he loves you. He loves me. He came to bring us salvation, to bring us hope, to bring us hope in this life and in the life to come. If you are here this morning and 2020 has been the roughest year of your life, I have good news for you. There is salvation in Christ. Whatever comes against you, he is prepared. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He will carry you through whatever trials and struggle and strife come your way. The King of Kings has come for you. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till come heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the
people said, Amen. Amen. Let us adore him. He has come for you, and he has come for me. Amen. Well, we have been in this series called Behold this Christmas, and um, today we're going to continue in that series, and we're going to be in this for a couple more weeks. But to behold, you know, it's such a a big word, and, and we don't use behold in our normal, everyday speech. You know, it's not like, behold! It's more like, check this out, hey! Look at that! To behold. To behold. And to behold means that we perceive. It means that we take in through, through uh, sight and through apprehension. We observe. And you know, as, as Westerners, you know, we observe Christmas. But to behold it in observation is a little bit different. You know, the Hebrew idea of of beholding is to fill up the eye, to fill our our vision with, and the Greek idea is to stare at and be single-eyed about it. To behold is Christmas. To do more than just simply observe it. You know, I can observe it in many, many ways, and in our society, our society does that. It uses terminology like happy holidays and jingle bells and all those different kinds of, of, uh, of things that, that we're all so familiar with. But, you know, the Christmas tree and the, the manger scenes and the lights and the banners and, and the wreaths and all the various things that we do and we're a part of are set up to remind us about the real and true meaning of Christmas. And granted, we don't know the exact day on which the Lord Jesus Christ was born, but we observe that day as we behold the King of glory. A biblical title given to the Lord Jesus Christ is that of Emmanuel, God with us. And Christmas is a celebration that the God of creation, the God of power, the God of strength, the God of knowledge, the God of of all has come to dwell with us. And therefore, we can declare uh, with with exuberance and we can declare uh, with great joy, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! And what is it that we're saying when we say Merry Christmas. What is it that we're saying? Well, that word Merry means jovial. Now this is, you know, from um, the older English dictionary, it means joy, jovial, loud, gay, exhilarating with laughter, to make merriment, happiness, joyful, exuberant. And Christmas, to gather about or to draw near to Christ to assemble before the Christ, to come and bow down or before, to mass or to amass before the Lord. And today when we talk about beholding Christmas, we're talking about beholding the salvation of Christmas. Listen to what Titus wrote. He wrote and said these words, For the grace of God has appeared. Now, what's the grace of God? The grace of God is that which we do not deserve. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people. The beauty of what Christmas is all about. God's salvation has appeared. This gracious act of God is summed up in one word. The word salvation. Salvation. It means to be defended by a defender. Salvation. You know, I remember as a kid hanging out in the neighborhood, you know, we we boys had this tendency to 
to fight with one another from time to time. I don't know if you girls ever did that kind of stuff, but we boys did. And, and I remember one of my cousins came to town that weekend, and, uh, and he showed up, and man, he's a, he was a big dude. And nobody's going to mess with me. He was my defender. And salvation means to be defended by a defender, to be rescued, to be delivered from peril. You know, to be delivered from peril, to be brought out of, of danger, to, to be brought out of, of something that uh, is not only demoralizing and demeaning, but it's destructive. It's to be pulled out of the way of danger, to be pulled out of the way of destruction. And when I read Dr. Luke's account in the gospel in chapter 2, this is what I read. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, filled with great fear. And the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, for behold... Observe this, fill your eye with this, be single focused on this. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we read earlier in the Gospel of Luke concerning Mary about the birth of this child. That she said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And there are two words here that jump out. That word, Savior, it comes from the Greek word soter, a Savior, deliverer. And properly, it's the Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves believers from their sins and delivers them into his safety. A Savior. And you know, we all need a Savior. You know, oftentimes we don't recognize that need. You know, we, we float through life and, and we don't recognize that need, but we need a Savior. I remember when I was writing my major writing project for my uh, doctoral degree. I had been working and putting everything together and typing it out and putting down the footnotes where all they needed to be. And I called the lady who was going to be the professional, put it all together kind of lady. It's going to be $400 to do all that. But I was sending it to her because I didn't want to have to do any kind of repeat, any kind of correction, all that kind of stuff. And I called her. It was the end of June. It was due uh, the 1st of August. She said, I'm sorry but I'm not doing this anymore. And I'd already contracted with her. And I spent the month of July up here sometimes all night long in my office typing and learning how to put those footnotes in because there wasn't a template that I could buy to, to download into the computer to make it all go right. And, you know, the spacing and all that kind of stuff. And, and I kept thinking, I need a savior in this regard. Have you ever needed a Savior? Maybe, you know, you, you had an issue, uh, some kind of a trouble in life, and you needed a Savior. Maybe your car wouldn't crank in the mall parking lot on a cold winter's evening and the stores were closed, and you're sitting out there by yourself, and you needed a Savior with a set of jumper cables. Or perhaps... You've spent some time in a hospital room. And you needed a Savior to heal you and to make you whole and to make you healthy. Or maybe you've been confronted with your own failures. Anybody have failures besides me? And shortcomings and issues in life? We need a Savior. Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, part of their, their steps is they've got to be dependent upon a power greater than themselves. We happen to know that the power is in the name of God himself. And here's the deal. In reality, we all need a Savior to help put our lives, not to help, but to actually put our lives back together again as we link up with him and, and hook up with him. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
is the one who comes so as to deliver us from danger and from destruction and into into safety. In other words, that salvation is being rescued by Jesus. It's like being, you know, tossed from your boat out here in the Gulf of Mexico and the waves are 10 feet and and the the wind's blowing hard and and it's all you can do to hang on and there's somebody that comes by and they throw out a life ring to you and they've become your savior because that life ring has a rope attached to it and they pull you in and they bring you to the place of safety. And Jesus is my deliverer then, and he's my redeemer, and he's my rescuer, my salvation. And the Bible says that this salvation, my salvation, and your salvation was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem of all places. Kind of an out-of-way place. It was about eight or nine miles from Jerusalem. Set at an elevation of about 2,500 feet, so it could be rather cold there. Mary and Joseph had made a long-distance track to get there. They didn't jump in their their Jeep and climb to that elevation. But by a donkey, she was great with child. And God brought all this about. And this word Christ, the Greek word Christos, it means the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. He's the one who, not, uh, who came not only to save us, but he came to deliver us. Now, oftentimes we put salvation and deliverance all there together. But Jesus came not only to save us, to take away our sin and make us presentable to God, but to deliver us from evil, to deliver us from the things that bind us, from the things that hold us, from the things that imprison us, from the things that enchain us. He came to truly set us free. And so he is the one who's come. And Jesus, as he has come, he takes us from one place to the next. So to behold that it's Christmas, and to behold his salvation means that we can say with exuberance and with joy, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Behold the salvation of God. So what does that mean? You ever thought about it? I mean, what does it mean? You know, our our issue, because I, I see everybody in the room looks like an adult just about. Just about. There's a few young ones out there that that still, you know, get the glow in their eye about Christmas. But you and I, for the most part, have experienced many, many Christmases in our lives. Do you remember what it was like as a child to be excited about Christmas? I mean, like, how many more days till Christmas, Kira? Five days till Christmas. Five days till Christmas. How many of you knew it was only five days till Christmas? Okay, there's a couple of you because you're worried about getting my gift. Five days till Christmas. But the reason we count down to Christmas as children is because we are so totally excited about it. Right? Right? I mean, it may not be the right thing for which we're excited, but we're totally excited about it. And you know, I remember a few of those Christmases as a child growing up when I was so totally excited. I shared with the Sunday school class this morning, I was so excited I needed a new BB gun so bad. And I was so certain that my sister had bought me one. I mean, it looked like it in the box. It was wrapped. It shook like one when I would shake it. And on this particular Saturday, my mother and my sister were away. My, I don't know where my dad and my little brother were. But I decided to peek at the end of that package. I peeled it open to find out, just to make sure that they'd gotten the right one. I wasn't going to pull it out and handle it. And when I peeked and it said pogo sticks, I went from here to here in my emotion. And somehow or another, 
We go from the excitement of what we think to the disappointment of the reality of the pogo sticks that we get in life. I've never learned how to walk on those things. Never did. I fell a couple of times. And so when we talk about beholding the salvation of God and beholding that it's Merry Christmas, what does that salvation mean? And does it bring excitement into our hearts and into our lives? Well, the God of Christmas, when we refer to salvation, he saves us from the slavery of sin. That's called redemption. He saves us from the slavery of sin, redemption. Now, what does redemption mean? Somebody take a guess. It means to be bought. It means to be removed from the marketplace. To be removed from the marketplace. Not only to be removed from the marketplace, but to be bought back. To be ransomed out of. And when we declare Merry Christmas, we're saying that God has sent his son and, 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 on, and he sent his son on a mission to redeem us. To redeem us, to buy us back. Now, why would God need to buy you back? To buy me back? Why would God need to do that? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We have been created in the image of God. But our maternal and our paternal grandparents Adam and Eve had a problem they were created in the beautiful beautiful image of God but they messed up they failed they sinned they fell away from God and and somehow or another that infused that sinful DNA into our makeup the Bible tells us for as in Adam all die for as in Adam all die in other words, you and I were born with a nature of sin. We're born with sin. And, and, you know, if you don't think that's true, why do we teach our children to tell the truth? If we don't believe that to be true, why do we teach our children not to steal? If that were not true, why would God have given those big ten commandments to us that we should love him with all of our heart and we shouldn't steal and kill and do all those different kinds of things? Sin is a part of who you are and who I am as, as, uh, as human beings. This inborn nature of sin is a curse. It's a curse. In the book of Galatians, Paul writes and says, Christ redeemed us from the curse. What does it say there, though? The curse of what? Now, what does it say right there on the, in the Scripture, in the box? The law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. This law is the law of God. So how can God's law be a curse? Well, the Ten Commandments are holy. You know, we don't even have to get to all of them to realize our own guilt. The very first uh, law of God, the very first commandment is that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. And, and you know, when I wake up and when I think that, I know immediately that I'm guilty. I know it. You know Why? Because I don't love God with all my heart. Now don't look shocked. Neither do you. We don't love God with all of our heart. You know, we, we start tainted. We start polluted. And the law is holy, but it cannot save us. It becomes a curse to us. If it could have saved us, Jesus would have never had to come and be born and laid in a manger in an animal uh, place in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us in Matthew 20, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, to redeem us, to remove us from the marketplace of sin. To remove us from the marketplace of sin. You know, without Jesus Christ, I'm just out there in the marketplace. 
I'm just out there being uh, grabbed by the various temptations and the various things that, that come my way. It's kind of like, has anybody in the room been to, uh, say, Morocco? Anybody been to Marrakesh? Marrakesh, some of you have been there. It's, a, it's really a, a pretty awesome place. But there's a huge market in Marrakesh called the Jamal Fanal. And, and when you go into that Jamal Fanal, it opens up in the evening. Man, all of a sudden, it feels like you're in Africa, because you are. And, you know, they, they might have been a couple monkeys out there and a couple guys uh, playing that flute, you know, uh, for the cobra to dance and all that kind of a stuff. And if you pull out a camera to take a picture, they want you to pay them for it and stuff. But uh, you, you walk into that Jamal Fanal, and there's all these temptations. You put, walk past all these food vendors that are cooking uh, sh uh, kebabs on grills to... Uh, selling nuts and dates and all this kind of stuff. And you get deeper and deeper into that marketplace and it gets closed in. And there's people coming back and forth and there's all these shop people and they're seeing you as not from being there. And here's what they're doing. They're grabbing you. They're pulling you in. And I remember being over there, one of, our, uh, one of the people traveling with us, she was looking at something and this shopkeeper got hard on her. And I had to redeem her from the shopkeeper, so to speak, to protect. And think about how we walk in life and how sin gets, you know, the temptations there. It's pulling at us. It's, it's, it's grabbing at us. It's, it's tripping us up. And, and we can't seem to free ourselves. We can't seem to get out of the maze of it all, well, just like the Jamal Fanal. But Jesus came to remove us from the marketplace. And in Romans 8, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You know, I was in that marketplace, but it was eating me up. I was in that marketplace, and I couldn't free myself. I was in the marketplace. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to love God with all my heart. I wanted not to steal and to kill, and I, I didn't want to uh, bear false witness, and I didn't want to do all these other things, but I couldn't do it. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he's removed us from that marketplace. To remove us from the marketplace. And there's something that happens then when Christ enters the heart of man. A change begins to take place a change begins to take place we've been removed from the marketplace of sin our interest changes what uh, what has happened is that the holy spirit has moved in we came to Christ in some way in that marketplace of life and 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 we called out to him and he rescued us and when he rescued us, the Holy Spirit of God moved into us and took up residence in us. And, and, and what we could not do in obedience before, the Spirit of God now enables us to do. We've been bought back. We've been ransomed out of. And God made you to live in relationship with him. He made you to walk in fellowship with him. He made you to expect to be in his presence. But sin separated us from that. God made us, and now he buys us back. And that is the message of Christmas. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Salvation's been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality and light through the gospel. Behold the salvation of God. And this God of Christmas not only saves us, from sin's marketplace, but it saves us from sin's separation. From sin's separation. In other words, alienation. Because, you know, when I'm messed up, I'm alienated from God. I'm separated from God. Matter of fact, I don't want to have to go and see God about my sin. How about you? 
It's like, you know, getting in trouble at school and having to face your parents when you go home. You want to avoid that. You want to act like it, it didn't happen. A number of years ago when we first moved here, my wife had this crystal uh, candy bowl that my mother had given her. She was away with the kids up at her parents that summer for a week or so. I was doing the good husband thing and dusting and cleaning up the house, and somehow or another I hit that candy bowl and it went off the table and it shattered into a million pieces. I went everywhere trying to find an identical Waterford Crystal candy bowl. Couldn't be found. They didn't make them anymore. It was an antique, whatever. You know how bad I dreaded facing my wife? It's not that Beverly's mean or, or, or tough, but that was inexcusable. Now, the kids get this real kick out of when she was away a couple summers ago and came back in after a week. Somehow I had broken a um, toothpick holder. Is that right? Man, I was worried about that one. Relieved to find out that it came from Dollar Tree, but I didn't know that. I just acted like, I don't know what happened to it. Why? We don't want to face up to our mistakes and to our failures and to all those other kinds of things. And so it brings a certain alienation. And, 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 uh, and, and God uh, redeems us from that, and he saves us from that alienation by reconciliation, by ending the separation, by bridging the isolation, by bringing us into his presence. He opens the door. You know, God knows everything, the Bible says. And when we go back to that maternal and paternal grandparents of creation in Adam and Eve, we find out a little later in Genesis chapter 3 that they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Wonder why they did that. But the Lord called out and said, Where are you? Now remember, God is omniscient. He knows everything. And they said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you're naked? God's making Adam and Eve fess up. It's not that God doesn't know. He says, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to? Now, here's the classic response. Eve immediately answers and said, God, that snake. And Adam says, God, that woman. They were tempted and they fell. And we fail to see this, the, the, the seriousness sometimes of our failure and of our mistakes and of our sin. Adam and Eve, they tried to cover it over. Now, you know, we've got that little artist rendition in which we do uh, uh, in children's Sunday school, and we've got a couple of leaves here and a couple of leaves there. I believe they actually tried to cover themselves up completely with a lot of leaves. And God, being who he is, being a merciful God, not giving us what we deserve and being a gracious God, giving us that which we don't deserve, God made a provision. And for the first time on planet Earth, we see the ramification of, of, of sin. God takes an innocent animal. And for the very first time on the planet, there would be blood spilled and blood shed. And he makes a suitable covering for them. All of creation had to be looking on. And in that suitable covering, an innocent animal had to die to cover the sin, the failure of Adam and Eve. 
And the Bible tells us in verse 24 of chapter 3, he drove out the man and, and, and uh, at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword and turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The mercy of God. Just think if man had gone back to that tree of life and lived like that without the possibility of redemption. And we see God bring it full circle. When we get beyond the birth of Christ in the Garden of Eden, where Jesus Christ is praying for you and for me, and he is under such intense pressure that he sweats as though drops of blood. Praying for us, and that's where the battle's won. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes and says that, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus Christ would become or, or come as the unblemished Lamb of God. Now, this morning in our Sunday school lesson, we, we studied about how, you know, Mary took strips of cloth and wrapped the baby. You know, just like we do babies today, right? You know, we, we take them and we, we bind them up tightly so they feel warm and secure and they're able to rest and they're able to go to sleep. And there's some thought that these shepherds that these angels appeared to were what we call Levitical shepherds. They served the temple and the flock they were looking after was the Levitical flock, the, the, the lambs being bred and delivered that would be offered on the table of sacrifice. And that they would even take strips of cloth and wrap those lambs up as newborn lambs. And here we have the Lamb of God who's born in Bethlehem and he's taken and he's wrapped, unblemished and unspotted, untouched by sin to live, to grow up, and to die on our behalf because, as in Adam, all die. But the next part of that verse in 1 Corinthians says, but in Christ all are made alive. All are made alive. Behold, the salvation of God. It not only saves us from sin's separation, but it saves us from sin's wrath. In other words, Jesus Christ is our propitiation. It means to appease. It means to satisfy. It means to diffuse and to unite. Jesus is our propitiation. He's the payment then as that unblemished lamb for us. Jesus went to the cross and he took the wrath of the law. The law says guilty, guilty, guilty. Guilty. You've got to pay the penalty. You're guilty. He took away the condemnation. He, re he rendered sin powerless because the law had been removed from the equation. Our faith is in the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. Now, that's an exclusive statement. Many people would want to say, every other religion in the world is going to take you to God. But that's not true. Jesus is exclusive. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one, not through Buddha, and not through all the, the gods of the Hindus, and not by uh, the prophet Muhammad, and, and not through science as a religion, no one comes to the Father except by me. Except by me, Jesus is exclusive. And Jesus takes the wrath of our lawlessness and brings us the hope of his perfection. And salvation is a gift. But what good is a gift if you can't use it or choose to never use it? 
Now listen to these words in verses 10 and 11 in Luke chapter 2. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is none other than Christ the Lord. Christmas. To mass, to amass before him, to gather about or draw near to Christ, to assemble before the Christ, to come and bow down before him. Merry, jovial, loud, gay, exhilarating, laughter, to make merriment, happiness, joyful, exuberant. Merry Christmas. Jesus makes a way because of our sin. But who cares about sin? Who cares? I mean, isn't that a pervasive thought that gets in the minds of society? Who cares? Who cares? I can tell you who cares about sin. God does. He doesn't want to see the people that he's created and the people that he loves going down to eternal destruction God cares about sin and there will come a day in eternity when this earth has been obliterated and all these other things that we've known are gone that every person who's ever lived will care about sin and God cares about sin for God is holy He's holy, holy, holy. That means he's wholly different than you and I are. He's perfect and he's without spot. He's without blemish. He's without wrinkle. God is holy. He's holy. You know, sometimes I think I, I've done pretty good this week. I've not messed up much this week. I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty pleasing to God. And then I'm confronted with the very fact that I'm not near as holy as God is. I'm not nearly as pure as God is. I'm not nearly as well put together as God desires me to be put together. For he is holy and I am not. And the only holiness that I can have in my life is where Christ rules and where he reigns and where he's in charge and he takes control. And my faith and my hope and my future has got to be pinned to Jesus Christ. For there's no other way. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. We read a little bit further. The Christmas account builds in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 34. We have a man by the name of Simeon who's been waiting on this promise of God to appear before he dies. And, and, and the Bible tells us that the parents, Mary and Joseph, brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. And Simeon, he took him into his arms and he blessed God. And this is what he said. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all people. A light of revelation for the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Grab a hold of this. You and I are much like Simeon. When we behold that it's Christmas, when our eye is filled with a revelation of what Christmas truly means, we're beholding the Christ child for who he is. We're beholding him as the Savior, the Redeemer, the Propitiator, the Appeaser, the gift of God that he is to each and every one of us. Because the problem is, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in Christ Jesus, we're justified by his grace, by receiving that which we don't deserve. Through a redemption, through the buying back of Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation to take on the wrath of the law for us. That's Romans uh, Romans 3, 23 and 25. John wrote in 1 John that he's a propitiation. The writer of the Hebrews said, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He came to earth. Think about this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're in perfect union, they're in perfect harmony, they're in perfect fellowship in all of eternity. My mind can't grasp the eternity of the past, but they're there in perfect 
harmony and fellowship and unity. And Jesus the Son, in some miraculous and mystical way, comes to earth and takes on the form of his brothers, takes on the form of humanity in the womb of his creation. The creator becoming dependent upon the creation. And every one of you mothers know what that's like. You know what that's like to carry that child in your womb. You know what that's like to to give birth to that child. You know what that's like to to be concerned about the every need of that child along the way. It's time for a bottle. It's time to graduate to Gerber. You know, it's time to to graduate to a six-ounce steak at Outback. You know? And oh, when it's time for them to graduate to a 24-ouncer. And the writer of the Hebrews says, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Can I tell you that Satan comes around to accuse you? We read this in the book of Job. There was that day when the sons of God came, and and Satan also came. And you know what he did? He accused Job. Ah, Job is just righteous because you've blessed him. Job is just a good guy because you've given him so much. He comes to accuse us. And can I guarantee you right now that Satan is accusing you? He's accusing you of your every failure, your every fault, your every sin, your every dark spot. He's accusing you. But did you hear that verse? That verse tells us that we have a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, talking about Jesus Christ, to make a propitiation for the sins of his people. Jesus steps in and says, But Father, not only did I die for Steve, but Steve has trusted me. And when Satan accuses me and when he accuses you, the righteous judge of God says, Case dismissed. Enter into the kingdom of heaven. Behold the salvation of God. And let me finish up, and I, I know I, I've gotten excited and I've talked a little longer than I meant to, but he, 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 he saves us from sin cycle. In other words, he abolishes uh, to, uh, to bring to an end, to eradicate, to obliterate, to stop. In other words, he brings about that change in our life. And when we've been truly saved, when we've truly entered into a relationship with God, get a hold of this. We don't want to be practicing sin anymore. We've experienced change, and we want to live in change. But somehow... You know, we, we also have this tendency that we want to sanctify our sin. We think, you know, we'll go to some church and somehow that's going to make it better, and yet we're not making any effort to, to change, to get away from it. And you come to church and then all of a sudden the preacher or I says something that kicks you in the knee, in the shin. You ever been hit in the shin by something hard? I was walking down a path in Montana one time in the dark without a flashlight, and I ran into a stump, and man, that hurt so bad, and it bled. I've seen people working out do those box jumps and and catch your shin on that box, and it just rips it open, and it hurts. And we come to church sometimes and the preacher says something and and it gets to us, it hurts. And all of a sudden, that person says, I don't like this church anymore. It makes me uncomfortable. Can I tell you something? You're not always supposed to be comfortable because God, I don't hear an amen on that. This is a Baptist church. I mean, you know, in the old days, somebody said, amen, preacher. And they're the one with the skint shin. You know, if we're really saved, our sin places us in a place of discomfort. 
But Jesus breaks the cycle of sin, and, the, and sin's no longer to have power over your life. Merry Christmas! In Romans, it says, We know our old self was crucified in him that order, this order, in order that this body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free. And right now, right now, this is what I want to do. Right now, I want to give you a chance to get your life right. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. It doesn't matter if you're in this room live with us or if you're viewing by live stream doesn't matter how deep the hole is in which you're stuck right now could I challenge you to get it right with God because right now God is throwing out to you a life ring you it might be like you're out in the gulf and there's 10 foot waves all around you and and the wind's blowing hard and you can hardly uh you know keep afloat and right now, he's calling your name, and he's throwing to you a life ring. But the question comes is, will you take it? Will you take it? You can't let embarrassment hold you back. Well, I thought I was a great swimmer, and everybody else thinks I'm a great swimmer. Therefore, I'm not going to accept the life ring. You can't let that happen. You can't allow what you, what you think others think of you hold you back right now. Well, everybody thinks I'm a good guy. Everybody thinks I've already been saved. Everybody thinks I've already done all this. Because now is the day of salvation right now. It's all between you and between God. Will you take the life ring of Jesus Christ right now? Christmas Eve, worship's going to be different this year. The baptismal waters are going to be ready. What better time to make a proclamation that I have followed after Jesus Christ than on Christmas Eve, the, the celebration of his birth, and say, I'm ready to be baptized. Well, how do you get ready? This is how. In the book of Romans, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, there's no such thing as being a secret disciple of Jesus Christ. There's no such thing. I've known many believers around the world that live in the middle of countries where it's illegal to be a Christian. It's illegal to be anything besides a follower and adherent of a certain religion. But when you've trusted Christ Jesus, you, you take on this idea for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. I'm not ashamed. You cannot be an ashamed follower of Jesus Christ. And can I remind you, there's salvation in no one else. For there's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. There's no other way. You'll never do it good enough you'll never do it good enough you know I can find fault in anything I can you may not know this in this room everything is supposed to be symmetrical emergency light on that column there emergency light on that column there supposed to be symmetrical but I I can almost guarantee you, I've not done this, but I can almost guarantee you, if you were to go and take a tape measure, you would find them to be out of symmetrics by some tenth of an inch. So it's not perfect. You can live the most perfect life, but just being out by a tenth of an inch is not good enough. So you're not going to get there by your name. My father was a righteous man. I can't get there because he was my father. Some of you say, well, I've been in a Baptist church my whole life, or a Pentecostal church my whole life, or a Methodist church my whole life. Well, you've been in a garage in and out your whole life, and you're not a car. There's only one name that carries us into heaven. And his name is Jesus. And he says, for the Son of Man has come to seek 
and to save the lost. And such were most of us, and such are some of you. I want to challenge you this morning to trust Jesus Christ this day to be your Savior and to be the Lord of your life. Would you do that? Merry Christmas. It'll be the best Christmas you've ever had. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Christmas. That we can come in a mass and mass around the Christ. And that we can sing with great joy and with great exuberance and with great triumph because there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And Father, I pray that in this moment, that there will be people who will trust Jesus Christ to be their Savior and not be ashamed about it. Of course, in Christ we pray, amen. Let's stand together as we sing this song. And I want to invite you. Come and say, Pastor, I'm trusting Christ today. I want to be baptized Christmas Eve. If you're viewing by live stream, you contact us in the church office tomorrow. Our number is 837-8107. And, and tell us. We'll get things lined up. We want you to be celebrating this Christmas as a part of the family of God. Will you come? In the darkness you were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to the virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the a pastor that's going to beg you to the altar or anything but I was reminded a number of years ago when I first came here there was a young lady that stepped out and said I want to follow Christ and I want to be baptized and I remember her grandfather saying you don't need to do that you've already been baptized you've already done this for some reason you know I, I just know that some people think they've already done it or they think about what other people might think but as we sing this last verse, if no one comes, I want to challenge you not to be held back by what somebody else might think or what somebody else might say. I mean, be pulled to the cross of Jesus Christ because he loves you. And he's a propitiation. He, he took on the wrath of the law because we couldn't do it. Come and receive the greatest gift at Christmas. It's greater than pogo sticks. I promise you. Would you come right now? One more verse unless someone comes. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to
raised forever to the King of Kings. I hope to see you back Christmas Eve at 4 or 6 o'clock. Merry Christmas.